Welcome back to Random Thoughts. This is episode 66. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, training to failure. Mm. And how, how counterintuitive it seems and how... When I first heard this, it was kind of it, it really messed with my confirmation bias. And it took well, me quite well, tra- a while. Training to failure seems intuitive. Yeah, that's that, so. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, and yeah. so it seems like I oh, if I want to get stronger, I should work closer to my failure point. I should need spots. I should be should, grinding you through sets. Never leave anything in the tank. Exactly. Yeah, every set should just be like smashing me. Yeah. But then when I started reading the research and suddenly at the science, it's the complete opposite. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting, and we touched on it. We. We care about it so much, we touched on it twice. Um, apologies for the yeah. slight loop. Well, line. we got interrupted. It's <laughs> distracting things just a little bit. Um, but I think it's it's good to really dive in and dissect it properly mm. um, because it's, it's a it's a fascinating paradigm shift. It's it, You're looking at it through one lens and the lens I think everyone looks at it through is more the muscular. Is better. And, uh, you know, the training, to, training to create damage. Muscular and the feel and the that being yeah. to war kind of feeling of training. I think yeah. it affects people as well, the psychology of it. Yeah, and so so from an intuitive perspective, if you if you want to break down muscle tissue and build more muscle tissue, it makes more sense that you train to damage, and the, the body responds to that damage, and away you go. But not all training is about maximizing muscle tissue. We're not all and then, and then as an aside, uh, interesting enough, there is some research coming out that suggests you don't even need to damage damage muscle for hypertrophy as you well. Can stimulate it. That's a whole other topic. I don't yeah. think we'll touch on today. Yeah. But it's interesting that mm. muscle damage is kind of like, well, break the muscle, they'll build back up, super compensate, and you'll go on your way. But not so much. Mm. So yeah. So the myth is that if you want to get strong, you've got to pay the price and push into into the dead territory and just rep it out and just never give up. Yeah. And yet, um, all of the strongest people, like all the strong people in the world, the proper strong people, they don't train to fail. Yeah. The powerlifting I, champions, Olympic lifting champions. It's, you know. it's fascinating because we used to work in a powerlifting yeah. Olympic lifting gym. And, and these are some seriously strong dudes, like pulling, deadlifting 300 kilos, squatting 200 for multiple reps. Our friend uh, Gawain Johnston, who's just dominating the Australian and world now. powerlifting. Yeah, he's, like, he's killing it. Absolute animal. These guys are lifting in all sorts. They barely go above a triple. Yeah. They barely go above three or five reps. And when they do that, they look like they've got two or three more reps in the same. Yeah. That's always how they train. They've well, got that sub-maximal idea. Particularly G. Like G, um, every, like his lifts are so fast. Mm. Like a bar flies. <laughs> yeah. Like he's always got more in the tank. Yeah. And it's it's the... Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the science in a moment. Should we talk about the phenomenon, actually how it works? Do you want to talk about strength as a skill? Yeah. And the neural side of things, yeah, first. Yeah. So... Um, we talked, we've talked before about the idea that if you're trying to acquire skill, you don't acquire skill to failure. You don't kick a footy until you cannot kick a footy anymore. You don't putt till you fall over. <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you don't acquire skill well under a veil of fatigue. Because yeah, it right. masks, it blocks your ability to make good decisions and execute. And, to, and, and um, not even so much decisions as to encode that motor pattern. Yep, because you need good quality reps. You need your body to go, ah, oh, that, like, for example, I've dabbled a bit with golf. And when I was finally starting to hit him nicely and starting to hit some strong, I was like, that felt good. You can yeah. feel the rhythm on that one. Yeah. And when you get tired, there are no more good ones. Yeah. There's just mess. It's like, I just need one more good one. It's like, no, you, you're done. Like, yeah. your session is over. Yeah. Um, and, and so in all skill-based areas, it's very well understood that you do that. And yet as soon as we move into strength, it's like, ah, oh, it's strength. It's different. Strength's yeah. a skill. It's flat out. It's, it's just a skill. Your ability to create tension, whether it's against a bar or against an opponent in a scrum or in a tackle or to box out, whatever it might be, the execution and the creation of skill and tension in your body is a massive skill. And it's not, and you know, like it doesn't just apply to strength. It's also plyometrics, sprints. Reactivity, power. Yep, for sure. Um, it's, it's across the board. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a skill and you've got to treat it as such. Um, and that's, that sounds, I think... Hopefully, if you're listening, that sounds logical that you would apply that same. But talk about the actual evidence base for that. Before I go evidence, mm. I want to go a little deeper on the strength thing. A skill, it's a skill, and people are like, ah, oh, no, you're just stronger people are stronger because they've practiced more in the weight room and they've lifted more weights. It's a skill in that your body has to send a relaxation and a contraction signal at different times. It's a timing and a rhythm mm. thing. Strength, you can't just put all the force in and hope it works out. You've got to lower the bar. You've got to, like bench press. Mm. You got to lower the bar. You got to bend apart. You got to be in a good position, mm. and then you've got to hit that chest at the right speed to get the right amount of power coming back out of it. If you're too slow or too fast, you'll bounce. If you're too slow, you won't harness yeah. the stretch shortening cycle enough. 
all these things when it comes to each of the lifts in themselves and then when you translate back on, onto a sporting field it's the ability to time and coordinate the right motor units and then also just the ability to recruit the big ones mm. so your Henneman size principle your ability to actually access and unlock your, your the big, big, guys. big fat mice and mm. heavy chain type 2 muscle fibers that is a skill and not mm. everyone can do it and that's why those newbie gains that people get when they get in the mm. gym and they just shoot up from nothing to pretty decent really fast that comes back to that because they've gone from no wiring to having decent wiring. Yeah, like exactly. They, they don't know how to do a pattern. They don't They've laid down some cables and now they're yeah. good to go a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you watch people when they first bench press and their arms are like, you know. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, the third time they do it, they've now got a, they've got a pathway. We talk about grease. The muscles all of a sudden aren't stronger. Hmm. The nervous system is flowing better. It's recruiting the yep. units in the right order. They're sequencing the timing. The rhythm is better. So uh, they talk about greasing the neural groove, which is, and, and one way of thinking of that is, um, uh, imagine you've got an, an overgrown path and you're, you're cutting down all the, all the trees that are overgrown, so it's just easier to, to get through. It's, it's almost a bit like that, like you just, the first time you cut that path, it's the hardest. Mm. Um, and then from then on, it's just easier and easier and easier. Interesting you say cut the path because in motor learning, it's actually the opposite. You're adding more myelin around. Well, you are. So yeah. what you're doing is you're effectively adding a wall yeah, you're adding and a, a fence to keep the bushes out. Sheath. Yeah, because that's, that's how skill training works. Mm. The, the neurons become laid down thicker and more I don't know why I'm using a metaphor when the actual thing is more interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about myelin. Yeah, so when you learn a skill but, of any type. So we're, we're just backtrack. Grey matter. Everyone knows grey matter, brain stuff. That's your the cerebral cortex. The, is, the is a big outside. deal. Uh, and we all know that the red matter, muscles, yep. is a big deal. Um, but white matter, the sheathing that encases our neurons, is a really, really, really big deal. It's an amazing book, The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Um, it's a fascinating exploration into, into using myelin and, and understanding how you can make it better. But if you get that sheathing better and thicker, then the, con the conductivity of the signal is way better. Yeah. yeah. And so that's how skill training works. If you practice guitar, for example, mm. the motor units, the axons, the neurons that control your fingers for that rhythm, that pattern, they lay down thicker and stronger and more durable myelin, which, which helps conduct that signal faster. So the first time you practice, it's like C chord, D chord. Because signal is leaking. And it's leaking and taking all the time and your brain has to con process it consciously. But as those, that myelin gets thicker and thicker and thicker and the, the nerve process can conduct faster, we go C, D, G, and then it's got, okay, now I've got that down. That's now automatic. I don't have to think about that. The, the signal is fast. Now I'll work on a strumming pattern. And mm. you build from there. So it's the same with skills, it's the same with strength. First, it's just, all right, how do I get from here to here on a bench mm. press? And then once you've got that down, it's all right, now I'll get it nice and tight. I'll get it with some power, add some velocity. I'll pause at the bottom. I'll add more weight. And that's how you progress a skill. Mm. Yeah. Um, my one's cool. My one's really interesting. The brain is fascinating. Yeah. It's such a cool thing. Um, yeah, and the, and the talent code they go into, they, they talk about talent hotbeds and they go into, they go into this, uh, this tennis school in Russia where the kids aren't allowed a tennis racket for the first year. They just have to do stuff really slow-mo and just lay down because it's a combination in terms of laying down the myelin of uh, intensity um, and focus, and, focus and, and, and doing it slow, slow enough that you can actually really construct the movements. And there's a real deliberateness to those. Deliberate uh, the, practice. The reps, yep. yes. Yeah, so it's... it's Mm -hmm. um, the same with the reason China and um, the Soviet Union and Russia are so good at weightlifting. Yeah. They're broom on a broomstick stick. every day of the week, four hours a day, practicing the positions, getting that bar to curl in the right yeah. way, getting your power spots, getting back under it. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the skill acquisition is it's a myelin thing. Um, but let's talk about the... Let's get back into more mm -hmm. of the specific mm -hmm. topic of today, the training to failure stuff. So the science is fascinating. I'll link, for those of you who are interested, I'll link a million or maybe not a million, but a couple of um, research can you, papers. Can you tell Jacob likes this one a little bit? This is, this is my baby. Um, so there's a lot of research that suggests, um, and, and it's, it's, a beautiful, it's really easy to study scientifically too. So you can just go one group trains to failure, one group doesn't train to failure, mm. let's see who gets stronger. And every time the group that doesn't train to failure will do less work, will achieve, and they'll monitor fatigue yeah. and exhaustion scores and, have it, and body weight and stuff like yeah. that. The group that trains to failure will, um, will increase their type one muscle fiber profile. So they'll gain more muscle, but it'll be the slow twitch useless mm. type in power sports. They'll be more fatigued, they'll have a greater rate of injury, and they'll achieve a significant reduction, significant reduction in power. Power is the thing that just plummets when you train to failure, and their strength will also stay about the same. It usually doesn't yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. But the group that doesn't train to failure, their power will skyrocket. Their hypertrophy usually drifts upward, nothing amazing. Yeah. That's a topic for another time. Yeah. Um, but then their strength, 
they'll get like in an eight to 12 week, they'll get like a 10% increase in an eight to 12 week. And that's like doing, so they'll work out their RMs before they start and they're deliberately trying to 50% of that. So if you got an eight RM 50%? Weight, a lot of the stuff you're saying, if you can do an eight RM, you should be doing fours. Wow. And that comes back to the velocity-based stuff mm. that I've been looking to the last couple of weeks as well. So velocity-based training is where instead of measuring the weight on the bar, mm. you measure the speed of the bar. And um, got to give props to Dan Baker on that. He's... His stuff is everything I've read. And so yeah. they did they did one of these studies where they did um, took 8RM and one group did, they were allowed a 20% decrement in speed and, over the set. And just to, to on Dan Baker, Dan Baker has been the power expert. Like he's invested his whole career in really going deep on... Is he with the Broncos now? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, he's he president, president of the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association uh, and a power genius, world-renowned. Travels, like, basically surfs a fair bit because <laughs> I'm Facebook friends with him. A lot of surfing. Yeah, he, tracks his, um, he tracks his GPS in the water. Too. <laughs> I love him with those graphs. <laughs> um, but travels the world, spreading his expertise on power. Like, he's gone deep on the power stuff and, and he got very interested in... Um, the velocity stuff and has been for a long time and yeah. it's just it's really interesting yeah and so one of the articles i read of his this is probably my favorite now mm. in this area um one yeah two groups one was allowed to go into a 40 percent decrement in power yep. or bar speed over the course of a set the other group was only allowed to go 20 percent. yeah so one group was effectively training a lot closer to failure by fatiguing more of the set okay if that yep. makes sense so the 40 yep. percent group was losing half their speed they were mm. just like they were burning, they were grinding yep. it out, if yep. you will. The other group was only once they got to twenty percent below, that was their cutoff. So if it was two reps, if it was six reps, that's so clever. So they were using the speed to measure their fatigue. So that way, on the days when they felt fresher, they yeah. actually got a few more reps in. So really, it's a bit too. This may be too nuanced, and you can slap me and cut this part out. We'll, tr- we'll let's we'll see try me, it. try me. <laughs> so um, there's training to failure where you just can't lift the bar. You any, literally need your spotter to lift uh, the bar off you, yep. or it just drops on the ground. And there's what we. Um, uh, we never do that. We do training to technical failure, where you train until it's no longer um, pretty. Yep. Um, where it's and so you you, le- you you go that was a that was a little grindy. Leave it there. Don't try well, that. That was, that was a little ugly. That, that's getting to, that's get, the next one's probably going to be ugly. Yep. But what he's actually doing is he's training to velocity failure. Yeah. Like he said, he's got a cutoff of velocity. That's the failure point. He goes bang. So it's it's another form of of that. Yeah. Um, and that's so really clever. It's fascinating. So the twenty yeah. percent group effectively did half the work over the 12 weeks. So this was half the reps that the other group did. And they were like 12 to 15% stronger yeah. at the end of it. And they felt, fr- and they reported fresher, they, their vertical leap was up. And the group that did more work and were closer to fatigue, they had more type one um, muscle hypertrophy, which actually slowed them down. So they gained muscle, mm-hmm. but in a power athletes, they were running. There'll, be some, there'll be some settings where you want that, but not for most of our. If you're adults. if you're healthy and you've got no real muscle mass problems, because we want we want a bit of what we want most of the time is people to get massively more explosive, faster, stronger, and have a little bit of muscle come along for the ride most of the time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's so interesting. So, do you um, want to sorry? Do you want to wrap up with your tastiness analogy? And because people will no, hear this and it'll hurt. And they'll be like, but yeah. no, it feels so good to train a failure. Yeah. It feels like I've done some work. Okay. It feels like I've been at war. I feel like that might be a good time. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so people, um, my experience is that people want, uh, people have expectations, they have a certain expectation of what you get out of training and how it should feel. Um, and you want to feel like a, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure if this is a swear, but you want to feel like a badass. Yeah, no, that's, not, f- that's not a swear. That's, 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 that's okay. fine, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's part of, I think of workouts as being like, um, like a meal. So a good meal should be uh, non-toxic. So it should, should, should not, be killing you. It should be killing no you, either fast or slowly. Um, and it should have nutritional value. I, it should give you benefit. And so in a workout sense, it should take you somewhere. It should help make you better. Whether that's athletically or postural correction or injury Whatever rehabilitation. It, yep. it, should, it should be have benefit. Um, and it should be also a good meal should be tasty because there's no point in being non-toxic and nutritious if it's not tasty. Yeah, we're not going to go around all day just eating bags of spinach. Yeah, or um, like bodybuilders sometimes do where it's like boiled chicken and with bags of spinach. <laughs> like those guys will do it, but the rest of us. So most people need a bit of tastiness. To make it um, palatable, literally. Yeah. And so the, so the way you do that with food, the easiest way is you tip in um, saturated fat um, and salt and sugar, and that makes it tastier but less nutritious and... Um, more toxic um, and that's the easy way I think in the same way that happens a lot with workouts where to make the workout tasty to make the workout like a good thing you throw in and it can be gimmicks yeah uh, so running running on the beach with a parachute that is tasty 
but it's going to give you a sore Achilles, sore, sore groin, one, probably, <laughs> and it's going to make you run slower and mess up the kinematics of running. Episode on sand coming soon. Because <laughs> <laughs> we get asked that a lot. Yeah. Um, another great way to make a workout tasty is to, to feel like a warrior, to train till you can't train anymore. Because like, that's what it feels like an inspirational movie. Yeah, and it looks great on Instagram. It's like, ah! But the actual people getting really strong, their stuff looks really boring because I've watched them. I've, w- I've watched the world bench press champion. Mm. I never um, got to see him train. Ange Galati. Oh my God, he was like 74 kilos and he could bench like 170 or something ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But uh, he lifted beautifully and there was no training to failure there. Mm. Um, and he was absurdly strong. You've never seen anything like it. It was really cool. Um, yeah, these guys, and they rest a bunch between sets. Yeah. They do a couple of reps, and catch so, the breath, no rush. Yeah, so if you... Uh, if you can have that wariness of, of, of knowing, if you know going in, ah, I'm going to be biased towards making this workout more tasty and I'm going to want to add in gimmicks. As a trainer or as an athlete. So yep. whether, you're, whether you're prescribing programs or whether you're doing the program. If you're looking at a program, like you, uh, I'm, the first thing I pick up a program, I'm looking, I'm looking for the fundamentals and I'm looking for the gimmicks. And is there overtraining in there? Uh, you know, yeah, is are there, they doing too much? Are they yeah. training to fail? So uh, a great real world example of um, how how we do this is you've got an athlete who can squat 140 kilos for five. Um, and an estimated maximum? Yeah, we're guessing. So probably, they, if you're really legit about it, they could probably get that to eight if you really ground it out. Yelled at them a lot and maybe yeah. did some smelling salts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we'll have them do their, so what we call their five RM, which may, maybe the eight RM, we'll have them do that for a triple. Do it fast for a triple, so really explosive. step away. Yep. Um, and you just you don't trash the nervous system. You can then come back sooner the next day and apply more stress because I think that's the big thing. Yeah. It's about how many um, times you can apply the stimulus to get them up and going. There was um there was an athlete um, I've forgotten the name, but he was preparing for the NFL Combine, and one of the things there I'm pretty sure this is from Tim Ferriss's um, mm. book. Um, this isn't ring a bell for me. Four so hour, four on, hour, four hour body. Yeah, you're on your own. Oh, my, right. I don't well, remember this one. Um, and it had an athlete, and they they measure how many times you can bench a hundred kilos. Yeah, it's a hundred kilo bench for reps. Yep. So rep, uh, rep for and he was below where he needed to be. And so what they had him do was sets every day sets of two. He would do like um, seven sets of two reps, um, yep. just to build, just to get the, that in the tank. But not fatigue because they couldn't afford to fatigue the muscles because that would damage the muscles and he wouldn't be able to go well. And then he because he'd much prefer to be able to, in that situation much prefer to be able to bench five times a week or six times a week sub maximally than once and not be able to do it till the next the yeah. following Tuesday six days later or whatever it is. And it's yeah. like um, Barry Ross who trains um, Alison Felix uh, who's an amazing runner uh, and he would have her do deadlifts where where he dropped the bar. Yep. Because he, he doesn't want that eccentric um, damage. And he wants less, less stress and he would do. The minimal effective dose just just enough and then yeah. step away mm. so train to failure is highly counterproductive minimal effective dose does not sound tasty yeah. but doing just the, just enough to get the result you need to enable you to acquire the skill and then build on that skill yeah. there's one more study i'm going to link down the bottom that mm. showed um vertical leap uh, the effects of a, a workout on vertical leap acutely, so okay. just in yep. the hours post. They did the same thing, a group that went to 20% velocity, a group that went to 40%. The group that only went to 20% velocity decrement over their squat workout, they were back to jumping the exact same height six hours later. The other group, 48 hours. So, so, so what you're saying so is the that, group that... That a group, group that, that trained close to failure and a group that was deliberately very submaximal. The group that was completely submaximal, like half reps, like we talked about before, that group... So, some maximum in terms of the amount of reps, so less reps. Yes. So, so the, the maximal, ju- uh, just because that could be a bit confusing. Yeah, sorry, yep. Uh, so they were training with their six RMs for threes, for yep. example. Cool. They then, they regained their pre-testing vertical leap height six hours after the workout. Yeah. Right. The other group that did do six RMs out yeah. of six RM, they didn't, they took them 48 hours mm, to get their jump height so back. So interesting, yeah. So if you're, if you're training multiple times a week for an athletic or explosive sport, you want to be, you know, you want to be leaving that tank fresh every time you hit the gym, so that Leaves. you can get on the court or on the field the next day. Leave something in the tank and work yeah. where it matters. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good, cool. I like it. All right. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, you'll find all the show notes uh, will be in this. Everything we've talked about, as always, linked in the description. That's going to be a long one. I feel like I'm going to go nuts on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we'll see you next time.